Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Come on, you're kind of late. We've already had stuff at 7 and 8 in the morning, so there you go. Good morning. I'm Ruth Katz, director of the Health Medicine Society program here at the Aspen Institute, a co-director of Spotlight Health. We're delighted that everybody's here, up and out early. Um, I promise you, you've got a great session ahead. Part of our intersections track, uh, I think the news speaks for itself, a lot of intersection between health and politics. I am delighted to introduce, um, personally delighted to introduce, Joanne Kennan, who is going to moderate the panel. Uh, Joanne is the Executive Director of Healthcare at Politico, which she joined in 2011, and where she's led a significant expansion of the coverage of health and digital, digital health coverage. And she's covered health policy for 20 years, a long time, uh, including uh, more than a decade on Capitol Hill. For those of you who had the great privilege of attending our late night session at the Meadows. Um, Joanne was there along with two other top health reporters. It was an incredible session. So I guarantee you, you're gonna have an incredible session this morning. I would also note that uh, this session is being carried live by Aspen Public Radio. So we're delighted about that. Joanne, take it away. Enjoy, ask very good questions. Thank you all for being here. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Reasonably bright and early. I told Ruth last night that the last minute event we put together proved that Margot, Julie, and I really could do this in our sleep. Um, <laughs> so uh, which, the topic today is basically Trump, the Trump voter and health care. And we have three um, very different and interconnected viewpoints here. Uh, James Frams Framsham, right? I'm just Framsham. Right? Framsham is from The Economist. He did a piece last year, a data analysis, that um, we actually featured in Pulse, although it was very hard to find again behind the paywall. But he kindly sent me a version. You'll be seeing some of the highlights. And it really looked at the status, uh, the healthcare status of the Trump voter and how significant that is. So we'll talk about that for a bit. And then Sue Curry is um, currently the acting vice president and provost of the University in of Iowa. Yeah. And, but more importantly for us, a, a lifetime expert and former dean of the School of Public Health. And she sort of wants to talk about healthcare really broadly defined, the social as well as the medical piece that we, we sometimes miss in our national dialogue and is very pertinent to the Trump voter. And I'm really just attempted to introduce Molly and Brody as my friend Molly, but um, he, that's not why she's here. <laughs> she is the senior vice for, a senior vice president of the Kaiser Family Foundation, and she is the, the brains behind those, the, all those tracking polls that we get month after month and really tell us a lot about um, why I have 20 people covering all the hair at Politico. <laughs> it is such an ingrained part of our politics. It's become such a problem. I mean, more than any other social issue, it's really a proxy for how we feel about government. So I'd like to, um, and there's a, a brand new fresh 3 a.m. poll that we will hear about from Molly in a few minutes that's very pertinent to what we're talking about today. So James, why don't you start? James yep. is actually a housing expert who, who, who stumbled into healthcare on a dare. <laughs> That's right, yeah. yeah. So I, I um, started my, my professional career as a housing expert. I'm now a broader general, uh, general data journalist. So I, I cover all kinds of things for The Economist. But, so this, this is kind of the story of my, my kind of discovery, I suppose. So the, the, the story begins on October the 1st last year. And I, I'm based in New York City, and I decided to... You can tell to, by the accent. Yeah, yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> And I decided to, to go and cover a rally for Donald Trump in, in Pennsylvania. So I, I drove uh, 150 miles due west um, to, to rural Lancaster County to the Spooky Nook uh, Sports Center. Um, and I, I arrived, which I thought was kind of quite early, and uh, there were massive lines outside. And I didn't want to be penned in with all the, all the other journalists in, in the kind of cattle pen and berated by the crowd. So I decided to line up with everyone else and, and mingle with everyone and, and, and just get an opportunity to chat and things like that. So that's basically what I did. And the weather was really bad. So um, Donald Trump was, was delayed. His helicopter couldn't land for, for some time. So I think it was about 90 minutes or two hours until he actually got, got up on stage to do his stunt speech, by which time I think I'd heard uh, Elton John's Tiny Dancer at least a, a dozen times. <laughs> and I don't think I can ever listen to that song again. So, um, uh, so he, he got up on stage, did his stunt speech, which didn't really deviate 
very much from, from that what I'd heard you know, on the television or, or streamed online. So I kind of got a bit bored and, and was running around the sports hall chatting to people to kind of discover their motivations and, and kind of their backgrounds and so forth. So there's a decent Amish population there who were kind of on the, on the outskirts of, 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 the, of the sports hall. And then what I discovered was, was right at the back of the hall, so there was kind of this big, long corridor. Um, you were kind of so far back at that point that the kind of vitriol of Donald Trump was, was kind of had lessened to a kind of a murmur, kind of a distant murmur. And there were a bunch of people just kind of sat down. And um, I was kind of I was looking for, at them from afar, and you could tell they weren't in great shape. And, and you know... Most of them had walking sticks. All of them, I'd say, were pretty, pretty overweight. And um, I, I wandered over to a couple of them and spoke to them and, and asked them about their motivations for, for turning up and the kind of usual stuff as we're not keen on Hillary. You know, he's right about a lot of things, et cetera, et cetera. I took a photograph of them, um, which I've got up here. So I'm going to... Um, I don't know if at the back you can see that, but... Um, and I, I took this photograph without... Um, the noticing, as you can tell, and I posted it to Instagram, and I got some likes, uh, and and then I I left the the rally, and and then kind of forgot about it for for about six weeks, um, and that was until till after the election, so after the shock of of Donald Trump being elected, and um, so on on the election night itself on, on the Tuesday evening, I'm, as a data journalist, the economist, running through the numbers, poring over the data to kind of work out, you know, what's going on here, what happened, how did pollsters get it wrong, A lot of people were asking that even though they were not data journalists, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. We're all doing the same thing, Every, you know, me and a thousand other people. Um, but my, my goal, I suppose, as a data journalist is to try and discover something that, that no one else really has thought about at the time. So, but the election, in terms of timing for me and The Economist, is kind of bad. So it happens Tuesday evening. We go to press in London on Wednesday night. So it gives us you know, literally 12 hours to try and discover some nugget for print, which I didn't find in that time. So kind of eight days later you're then basically the, the election feels like a distant memory and then you've got to kind of really find something kind of really worth saying if you're going to say it kind of once the, once the print issue lands on people's doorsteps 10 days later. So, um, but I was spurred on by uh, a pollster called Patrick Ruffini who some dared of you, you may know. <laughs> yes. Literally, right? He dared me, exactly. So there was a, there was a challenge he set um, on Twitter. So he runs a, a polling firm called Echelon Insights. And he'd been pouring through the numbers like everyone else and discovered, like everyone else, that the percentage of non-college educated white individuals on a county level basis explained a lot of the, the swing um, from 2012 to 2016. In from places exactly like Demo in Lancaster County. That was exactly, exactly where the election was decided. Yeah. yeah, precisely. Yeah. So in these swing counties, this, this vote really mattered. So, th so you, can ex you can explain a lot about behavior by education and race alone. And that's really interesting. And then maybe for lots of people, that's kind of good enough. And you, you move on and, and, and go and think about something else. But he set a challenge and said, you know, this explains about 41% of, of the variation in the swing on a county level basis. Can anyone else find another stat that, that beats it? So I went, you know, not stat wanting hunting. to... Sh yeah, exactly. <laughs> not wanting to shy away from a challenge. I went and and trawled through the numbers. And everyone uses the American Community Survey um, data. So this is the Census Bureau survey. It's a 1% sample. You know, it, it's, it's very much like the decennial census. And everyone has these numbers. So everyone was coming up with the same kind of things. So what I need to do is think about something that no one else had really thought about. And then that's when I thought about this photograph and thought, well, maybe is there a relationship between ill health and, and enthusiasm for voting um, Donald Trump? So I was aware of the University of Washington's Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. They have some really good data sets there. And they have a great county-level data set, or several data sets, covering obesity and diabetes, life expectancy, and um, alcohol. alcohol, exactly, and rates of exercise, too. 
Uh, and so I, 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 I pulled down these numbers, plugged it into my R code, and ran it through. And to my amazement, yes, they were significant. Um, and what I did was to basically take the, 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 um, the coefficients from each of the individual variables and create an index of health metrics. Um, and that, I found, did beat uh, Patrick's 41%, and it came out as 43%. So the, the R squared was 43%. And then, so, which is pretty cool. So I, I got my story, and this was Monday, I think, or Monday evening, and I wrote up the story on Tuesday, and then we printed this on Wednesday. So I came up with this great chart, which I think is a great chart, anyway. So this shows on the x-axis an index of, of county health metrics, as, as I stated, obesity and diabetes and so forth. And then on the y is the, the change in the, the margin, so the swing, effectively, from Republican to Democrat between 2012 and 2016. And that demonstrates, I think, really nicely that, that ill health or counties that suffer from ill health um, also were the most enthusiastic for, towards Donald Trump. So basically, the, what you found was, I mean, the, the headlines about the Trump voter had been not that well educated compared to much of the country, uh, job loss, a feeling of economic being left behind. Um, and I think that's, there's data that, that is part of the profile, but you also found the characteristics of the Trump voter were being overweight, drinking too much, having diabetes, um, not exercising, those are all things that link, of course, and a lower life expectancy yeah. um, than, than we had. And, and what was sort of like, before we turn to, to, to Sue, like what was your wow moment when, you know, you, you didn't come at this expecting to find this? Um, that I think all of us who travel in this country have some mental image, and I'd actually like to leave that photo up because go back to your yeah, photo. Yeah, sure. This is called the vitality in the vote, but I mean, I think this image really is who we are going to be talking about, and I think all of us who've traveled um, to, you know, a quote Trump country has seen something like this that is locked in our mind. So we'll keep this up there. So as you, you know, when did you sort of say, kaboom, this is, this is my wow moment. This is like, I really want to something here. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think for me, I haven't lived in America that long. But you so knew we were I, fat. <laughs> <laughs> I'd heard, I'd heard about it, but when you live in New York City, you know, you, you don't... walk, people in New York walk. Exactly, yeah, so you're very much in a bubble there, so you really, but it's, a, it's remarkable for me just, you know, how short a distance you can go and to see just how um, the population changes in, in that short time. Um, I, think, I think the wow moment was just how striking a correlation it was. Um, and to, you know, to what extent that mattered, it, even within states, you know, the different, you know, different values attributed to counties. So we, the examples we gave, just to go back to the chart, is um, Knox County and Jefferson County, who, which are both in Ohio. So Ohio was obviously the big shock state. And, and um, Knox and, and Jefferson have very similar populations of, of um, non-college educated whites, so about 80% or thereabouts. But Knox is much healthier than Jefferson. And Jefferson sits quite a way to the west, I think, of Knox. And uh, I've not been there, but, um, but it, you know, people there are heavier drinkers, they're, they're fatter, um, they suffer from you know, worse health. And that, those, you know, the health elements explain about six of the 16 percentage points difference in, in the margin. So, so even within states, it's really quite striking how, how much health appears to have made a difference. So if the Democrats really want to win in 2020, instead of finding the right candidate, they just have to change our eating habits. Quite. <laughs> That's the, I mean, the inference you can make is extremely powerful. I mean, so I, I... Which is really hard to do. I'm married to a couch potato. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wrote it down. I, I, think... I don't think he knows this is live. No. <laughs> So, Hi, honey. <laughs> I mean, but the margins are tiny, and obviously they, they, they obviously with the electoral college they matter a lot. But say in in Michigan, if diabetes was was seven percent less prevalent, or in Pennsylvania, activity people are eight percent more active, or five you know five percent of people were um, less heavy drinkers in Wisconsin, that would have been enough to send Hillary to the White House, <laughs> in theory. But we can't rerun, a, rerun the election with healthier voters. We don't, we don't know. But, but the inference you can make is kind of fun. So. 
Well, that takes us exactly to where we want Sue to talk before. Um, I mean, we, we, we talk about health care narrowly. We, we, we tend to think of health care, or a lot of our, the national politics has really been about coverage and who gets covered, how do we pay for that coverage, who pays for that coverage, is it a right, is it not a right. Those, and, and we'll come back to that in a minute. But he really, um, James really brought up, you know, and you can't, you need, you need access to medical care. You know, you can't cure everything just by, you know, getting on a treadmill. Sue, Sue has been really concerned and, 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 and wants to talk a little bit about what we're missing when we talk about health in terms of only insurance and how it really ties into you know, what we call social determinants and also at this particular time, if they're really going to be taking something like 800, um, $834 billion out of Medicaid, where, where in, in both red states and blue states, it is not... Um, this, this discussion about health and housing, health and diet, health and education, health and homelessness, health and food security, that these are really, you know, you can't, we're, we're way too siloed and how do we come together? That discussion is actually happening across America and in the health policy world and in the healthcare delivery world, um, Medicaid state officials, and it is not ideological. I've, I've spoken to, you know, very conservative um, state officials who, who are really trying to put these pieces together. How do we broaden that dialogue, and what happens to that sort of course of action if we have these kind of cuts? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let me just make a, a, a few in introductory points. Um, what, what James's analysis uh, showed are very real and very troubling health disparities, and they do tend to cluster geographically, and you can live five miles apart in parts of this country and have as much as a 20-year difference in life expectancy. Um, and uh, so I, I think that we do need to um, take these uh, very uh, seriously. And when you start to unpack the disparities that we're seeing, um, you, you do go beyond um, access to health care. And you start to look at um, or you, you go beyond actual illnesses, um, and you do start to look at some of the root causes, um, obesity, um, alcohol use, and so forth. What I think we need to be very careful about is when we bring it to the individual level, we start um, pointing fingers. Um, if you didn't drink, if you didn't eat too much, if you would just exercise more, and the determinants of what people can and can't do to improve their health go far beyond what an individual person can do. And I don't want to lose that part of the dialogue. I also think that, you know, we, um, that people who are in these situations, who are sitting in places like this, these people are probably, most of them are younger than I am. Um, and I'm not that young. Uh, and, and so when you, uh, you know, when you start to um, look at these folks, they actually know they're not well. Um, they know that they want their communities to be healthier places. Uh, they're not complacent about this. And this is what I think we saw in the voting patterns. Um, and of course, the question comes up, and it's very acute now when we're looking, you know, staring at a new piece of legislation that, you know, we're starting to peek, the, peek behind the curtain on. Um, they're not voting in their self-interests. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the last piece that I'll, I'll talk about, which you alluded to, is when you start to think about health more broadly, not just as the absence of illness, but the ability, um, you know, to live full and productive lives um, in your communities, uh, you start to look at what we call the social determinants of health, um, education, um, housing support, the built environment, um, food availability. Uh, you know, there are people, I live in Iowa, which is a very rural state, um, people uh, are doing their food shopping um, at Casey's. Casey's is a gas station that has a little market. Okay, that's their food um, availability. So we have to look at all of those um, kinds of things, and those relate to, on the policy level, what we would call social expenditures. What does our society invest um, to improve the conditions in which people live? And that is not health care policy. 
Um, I'll have more to say about that, but I don't want to monopolize, so I'm going to stop there. But I, I thank you for giving me the chance to be a little passionate about some of these things that <laughs> well, tend to get ignored when the, when the topic is, is on um, you know, caring for people who are sick. But they're really important things because we are, we are learning. I mean, the data, not just the correlations of, you know, we, we know that edu your educational levels affect your lifetime health. We know that now. Um, and we also, so it's both on sort of large, how do we think about the connection between the social and the, right. um, and, and, and the health, but, and also on the more granular level, you know, you can't take a little old lady who just had hip surgery and dump her outside a house and expect her to miraculously get up six flights of stairs and order her food and, you know, it, it, there's, there's, there's the how do you help the individual social right. immediate yeah. needs, and, and as well as these larger issues that a lot of America looks like that picture. You know, we all have seen, we've all walked in and said, this is it. Mala, you have some brand new data. I do. Um, I do have some brand new data. Um, taking this from, you know, as, as much as the country is discussing sort of social determinants in these broader intersections, that is certainly not the political conversation in Washington right now. Um, but, and, and I do, I have hot off the press, just released today, new yeah, tracking yeah. data on <laughs> what Americans and Republicans and Trump voters think of this bill. But before, I gotta make you sit on your seats for one more second. I wanna say something, um, pick up on what Sue just said about not voting in their interests. Um, I, I, this is one of the things that's always been challenging, right? You, you often see the case where particularly sort of lower middle class uh, less educated white voters um, do not appear to be voting with their pocketbook or in their interest because, especially in this last election, there was a, a, a big choice between what kind of social contract um, the, the, the two um, candidates were going to provide for you. But what's interesting, and we've just finished a big survey um, of rural voters, and we did focus groups, funny enough, in Ohio as well, Ashtabula County, which was, I mean, everybody in the world is doing focus groups in Ohio with Trump voters right now. I'm just going to say it's like the hot new industry. But here's what that. <laughs> but, and, you know, what was so interesting in, in our data and in those conversations is that these Trump voters, and again, this is a county that had voted, you know, 16 points for. Um, President Obama in 2012 and now 20 or 30 points for President Trump in um, 2016. You know, what they said around the table is, you know, yeah, I'm just, I got insurance or I'm just, you know, I buy it this way, but my deductibles are so high, my co-pays are so high, I have to be dead before I go to the doctor. But those people on welfare, they just get it for free. And they can just go and get what they want for free. So this, they're, what we were hearing around the table and you know, this other family, this woman was saying, me and my husband sit around the table all the time and we just like, we, we put up our hands, like why are we working so hard? If we just went on welfare, and again, you know, I'm not sure factually it's welfare or it's Medicaid or in the, they're in the, the markets and getting subsidies, but if we were just those people who have won the lottery and don't have to do anything and get it for free, then, um, then, then they'd be okay. And so I think that, that in their minds they really were in some ways voting their self-interest in that here was a candidate who was promising to make things fairer for them and to get rid of um, government abuse of benefits, which is something that is really driving their, their thinking because they do feel very left behind. And so, you know, when you do talk to them, the first issues on their mind are jobs and opioid epidemic, which I know we will talk about, but that's feeding a lot of these health outcomes as well. Um, they don't talk about health care per se, unless they're talking about it as the fact that even if they have it, they can't afford it. And so the number one thing to take away from this conversation is what Americans want from their healthcare system, what Americans want is to pay less for healthcare, and that's all they've ever wanted. So with that, I'm happy to tell you the headlines from our poll. If you want me to go there. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's go. Okay, so what, so what we know as of this morning is that the ACA um, is, uh, the favorability on the ACA has, for the first time in our polls, we've done it for over seven years every month. So I've had about 100,000 respondents. For the first time ever, favorability of the ACA is at 51%. Unfavorable is at 41%. Um, the, on the new Republican bill, uh, the favorability is at 30%. And unfavorably, unfavorability is at 53%. What's particularly interesting today is that Republicans, who of course have uh, um, 
favor the Republican bill, but their enthusiasm has really dropped. So in May, when we did ask the same question, two thirds of them said they favored it, and now it's down to just about half. Um, so they dropped 11 points in one month, which is a very big deal in polling. Um, I think that what you can say about Republicans and Trump supporters with respect to the bill that dropped yesterday is that they want repeal of the ACA. They always have wanted repeal the ACA. They don't really like the stuff in this new <laughs> law, and they're pretty lukewarm about it, but they do want repeal. And so that is sort of the dilemma for senators. They are actually, you, there is no way you could say that senators designed this bill based on public opinion polls. They, they may have consulted public opinion polls, but they certainly didn't follow what they say because this bill is not consistent with what the American public says they want or even what their constituents say they want. Um, so you have uh, the legislators who are going to put forward um, a, a big change, and if they do pass it, in 2020, 2022, these Trump voters and Trump supporters could be very surprised by what repeal and replace ended up meaning because what, what they're going to get isn't what they want. Um, so that's kind of the I mean, one thing line. we've been doing polling with the political has been doing a series of domestic policy polls with the Harvard School of Pol Public Health this year, and we find a really consistent, you know, soup that the Trump base wants repeal. And they want it in some of our polls that they want it more than the wall, more than immigration, more than tax cuts, more than anything they want. Sometimes it comes up as the second priority. Often it comes up as the top priority. On one of our polls, it came 80% of Trump voters repeal was the top priority. That was a few months ago. They were getting a little bit more nervous about what it looks like. But no, they haven't stopped. They want, they want Obamacare to go away, and they want something great. Right, <laughs> they want free. To, they want everything for free. Right. Um, now, this is an anecdote. Okay, it's not date. We're allowed. Um, so we're, we're going to do it before anecdote. 10 a.m. But, but, yeah. but you know, <laughs> if, if you go online, you can find um, what I think is a um, an exemplar interview with one of these folks who says, "I want Obamacare to go away," and the interviewer says, "What will happen to your insurance if it goes away?" And he says, "Oh, it's no problem because I'm covered by the ACA." <laughs> and I, I, you can, this, this is not made up. I mean, it's, you know, person on the street kind of interview. I don't know how many they had to do to get to that one, but, um, but it's there. So, you know, I, I, um, so, so I, I think that... Um, but that's been true well, of Molly's think, polling, yeah, the, the, yeah, the yeah. amount of confusion. I, should, I mean, right. we should just say, we should start with the, the fundamental things you need to know about people's views and experiences on Obamacare is that they don't understand almost anything. They only wanted their cost to go down, and that's not what they saw. It's completely driven by partisan identification. Everything you think and everything you report to me about the ACA or Obamacare, if I know your party ID, I can predict with almost certainty what you're going to say. Not just your opinions about it, but your experiences, whether you've had negative or positive experiences. And I can do that whether you're in the exchanges or whether you're a doctor talking to me about it or whether you're have on Medicare. I can tell you what you're going to say because of your party in politics. So the, those three things have been so consistent from day one um, that we have to just remember that, that the law and any conversation about it and ever asking about it, all it really triggers for people is whether you support it or didn't support President Obama and his administration. That's what it's really right. a measure of. It's, that's, a, it's right. a measure of almost nothing else. And that's why, that goes back to how I started, why we have 20 reporters and editors covering health care. Because we can't, I mean, the, the Republicans said, and those of you who, who were there last night, I said this, sorry for the brief duplication, um, the Republicans attacked the Democrats after 2009, 2010 for doing a partisan bill, right? It was a partisan bill. It did not get a single Republican vote. However, there was no way they could have done a bipartisan bill. It was a partisan bill or nothing. We're, and we fought about it for eight years. We can't fix things because of the partisan stuckness. Deep beyond, I don't have a word big enough for stuckness. We're beyond stuck. And we're about to have the same thing, right? Whether this, the Senate bill passes or not, Whatever happens from here on out, it's partisan. Whether their bill passes without any Democratic votes or whatever fallback we end up on with state flexibility or whatever in the future, it's, it's going to be very partisan. So, you know, we, we all joke it's the full employment for healthcare journalists forever bill. But, we, we, but the, one of the striking things, one of the things I love about the Kaiser polls is if you look at, if you, when you ask people about what's in 
the law, yeah. right? Do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like this? Do you like? Yes, 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 yes. Accept the individual mandate. Do you like the affordable care? Oh no, I hate it. Right. You know, it's it's it is more popular. It, the sum of its it's less popular than the sum of its parts is, I okay. think, the right way of saying that. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Sure. Pull it back from politics to health. Um, right. because They're related. That, which, They're uh, all the same. If, if it's okay. Right. Um, because I, I think that, you know, having an article like this come out in The Economist and um, having just glaring in front of your face um, what health can do um, in an election, uh, you know, if you, if you dig into it, um, and hearing that people just want to pay less for health care, um, let's just step back for a second. We spend more on health care in this country than any other developed nation in the world. And our outcomes are worse than virtually every other developed country in the world. So yes, I mean, I think that you could say to someone, you should want to spend less on health care, because you're not getting what you're paying for. Um, and then when you, um, you know, pull that out and you take total expenditures on what could create health, so not just health care expenditures, but social expenditures, and you put those in a horse race, social expenditures win. They explain much more um, of the advantage in life expectancy and the prevalence of, of you know, chronic illness and, and so on and so forth. And so as long as we continue to have a dialogue in this country that focuses in the box of what we do in healthcare, we are going to have these people, we are going to have these graphs, we are going to see it get worse um, because the impact of social expenditures is actually greater in countries with more income disparity. And we are, so, you know, when you line up all of the different pieces of information that we want to look at when we see something like the article in The Economist, um, you are not checking the box in the plus column in this country. Um, and I think just to add to that, I mean, and it's a point actually um, the journalist made last night, is that with um, the potential cuts to Medicaid that they've that is on the table right now, and the public health and prevention and the, fund pu goes the away. public on. health prevention fund, there's you know states are going to be um, you know it was eight you know maybe it's about eight billion or something. We'll see what the CBO says next week. But states are not going to be able to make up that all that money. And the places, if they're going to have to make up any of it, are going to come from other places they're already spending on these social expenditures. Right. And so, I mean, so we're already not spending sort of a, enough on investment we're in that area. We're spending too much and not in the right places. Right. right. And there won't be, I mean, there's going to be more um, competition for funds at the state level. I think that's one thing for people to really think about with um, what's happening in Washington right now is this idea of state flexibility. You know, a lot of people like that idea, but what it means is you have the education folks fighting against the, you know, prison and law enforcement folks fighting against the healthcare folks and the public health folks for less and less dollars in the states, and so that's yeah. going to be a bigger challenge. There, uh, I do want to touch on opioids very briefly before we turn to audience questions, and I know there's several other um, events at Aspen this week only about opioids. So I don't want to spend the next half hour talking about it, but this is also. It's not that it's only in Trump country. Mm -hmm. It is not. It's everywhere. It's tragic everywhere. It's getting worse, not better in some ways. But you know, you didn't look specifically at that data. But have you subsequently made other connections, or you know, have you come across ways in which the opioid crisis is overlaid on the on the data? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I haven't looked specifically at, at the opioid ep ec epidemic. No, but. I mean, obviously, to speak about the social determinants, I mean, this is obviously intertwined with labor market outcomes, housing outcomes, and you know, so it's, it's difficult to, to disaggregate these things from one another. I mean, for me, from my point of view, I'm, I'd be very interested to learn more about to what extent this is a function of either access to, you know, what combination of, of healthcare access and social determinants, you know, and what mix matters well, in most. In some there. cases, it began with healthcare access. It began with legal <laughs> yeah. prescriptions, yeah. you know, that were, that were too much to the wrong people. Yeah. yeah. Or people with bad luck. I mean, people who got a perfectly 
Oh, well, that's a whole other long discussion. Uh, I mean, I'll take us back to Ashtabula, um, Ohio. So we, you know, started, you know, what's going on in your community? What do you want people to know, you know, across the nation? And of course, they started in on, you know, job loss and economy and the decline of the industries. And, you know, you could, the only jobs here are blue collar jobs. You can get a job if, you're, you, know, if you, you, you hustle, but it's a blue collar job. It's not a good place for kids. As soon as that conversation sort of died a little bit, the moderator asked, um, you know, is there anything else here that's going on in there? Oh, yeah, those drugs, those opioids. And everyone knew multiple people. And they're like, and it's not who you think it is who's on those and who it's in that. It was this person. And they just go on and on and on about their stories. Um, and so, and there is an immediate, like, reaction about sort of the, the stigma. And then there's, in every group, somebody says, well, it's not who you think. That was me. My doctor, I was in a car accident. I, you know, had a back pain. I, you know, got addicted. I couldn't get off. I went to a substance abuse program. So I'm, so the idea that, I mean, this is so um, ubiquitous in these communities. And again, the, um, you, it is so tied up with the politics today of what governors are going to need to be supporting in their communities. Most of the substance abuse and mental health treatment and the programs that can help people are funded through Medicaid or through other sort of state programs. And again, back to social determinants, this is, you know, really going to be, there's, there's, you know, we're, as they said yesterday, um, New York Times op-ed yet said yesterday, we haven't even hit the peak of this epidemic yet. And um, there's no way um, to know how the country can respond to that with, I think they have $2 billion in the bill for it. Right, We'd, they'll have more by next week. Yeah. But, all right, I, uh, <laughs> let's, let's open it to some audience questions. Um, wait, who has the mic? Okay. I have a question, I right have a question here. here. Uh, my, my name's Dr. Anita Gupta. Um, just on the topic of the opioid epidemic, I'm actually a pain specialist, ah. uh, coincidentally, and I'm an innovator and entrepreneur um, here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Um, it, to me, the opioid epidemic is actually in line with the politics of healthcare policy. Um, I'm a Princeton University um, Woodrow Wilson Fellow looking at public policy for this very issue um, because it's an $80 billion problem. And when you look at the socioeconomic problems that individuals who don't have health care, you know, what is the solution then? Um, because those individuals need health care to solve the addiction issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what kind of solutions do you see? You know, for those people who need health care, um, you guys are really smart. <laughs> and I'm about to embark on policy solving issues in health care. Um, and I, I go to Capitol Hill talking to policymakers. You know, what would be the one thing to ask? You know, what would be the ask? Um, I'm going to add to the, to, you need, you know, treatment, obviously, um, but jobs, uh, home security. Um, <clears throat> child care, elder care. Um, you need the ability to live a productive um, and optimistic life. Because you can treat the addiction, but if you don't treat the social circumstances, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, and I know there are a lot of people who have <laughs> opioid addiction uh, who have those, you know, have families who are supportive and, and, and roofs over their heads and, and so on and so forth. But if you peel it back, um, the recalcitrant, the, the hardest are folks who have that and are lacking in these other things. So the policies need to look beyond what you're going to do in health care. And that is not to say instead of, but we need to start having the and conversations um, to these other factors. And I would just say one thing, and as a pain specialist, you're probably aware of this. Um, we just spent, prior to this meeting, three days um, with the Aspen Health Strategy Group talking about this very issue. Um, and one of the things that um, we had done a survey of long-term long opioid users, so people who had been on them for two months or more, many of them had been on them for over two years, um, um, not for cancer end of life treatment. And the vast majority of those people say that it helped them and that it is a positive impact on their life and that it's changing their life and making them able to live their life. There is a subset there that it tell us they're addicted and dependent and that it's negative for them. But there's a real challenge in the policy arena here because it's not, um, it's, it's not sort of a, a, a single easy case where it's always bad. Um, as pain specialists, I'm sure you've had plenty of, of incidents where 
um, opioid use in long-term opioid use was probably quite appropriate medical care, so that gets complicated. The other thing I would say to everybody is that the future of all of these discussions is going to get more and more um, localized. So there's going to be so much more and more variation at the state level and the local level given some of the changes that are happening in Washington. And that's a real difference in ideology between sort of the two different administrations. The Democratic administration was really federalizing and making sort of things equal across attempting, our states. Attempting. So oh, attempted, right. 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 But it made some progress. <laughs> um, and then um, the new administration, and certainly Republican in administrations in general, um, go to much more of a decentralized um, situation, and in this case, and I think particularly in healthcare policy, in social determinants of health, in these issues, these social issues that we're talking about, more and more action is going to be at the state and local level, and that actually potentially provides a whole bunch of opportunities for many people. Right. Question here. So, Molly Ann, you really hit it on the head. It's the money. <laughs> But no one is really dealing with that. I'm a health economist, and <laughs> the ACA really didn't deal with cost. The new bill doesn't really deal with cost. Yet everybody knows that's the issue. What is it going to take to get people to have that conversation? Because there are things we can do. But it's like no one wants to talk about the things we could really yeah. do to reduce costs. And yes, there will be some pain with that. You cannot have everything you want. But we need to have that conversation. And when's that going to happen? Yeah, I would tell you, you know, if, if I had, whenever I gave talks about what went wrong with the ACA, my first point, well, there's two things. One, they didn't have a little um, sticker that said, brought to you by the ACA. So lots of good benefits accrued to people that they had no idea came to them from the ACA. Like, so things yeah, like preventative, preventative health, reproductive health care, um, uh, lots of things. Every, the only thing people actually knew is that their kid got to stay on their health plan. But most other good, like, positive things that helped a lot of people, nobody knew about. So they didn't have a, they didn't have a stamp of brought to you by the ACA. The second thing they didn't do was have the tweet version of, this is the policy in this 1,200 page bill that will reduce your health care costs. There was never that one liner that said, this is how we're going to reduce your costs. And that is because it is, it is a hard political question. It's an economic question. It's a redistribution of wealth you know, from providers to, you know, and insurers and from a lot of people to people who are actually paying out of their pocket. Um, and, you know, there's a lot we don't know about how to do that. There is a lot we do know. The ACA uh, allowed for an awful lot of innovation and an awful lot of an experimentation. Um, you know, those results aren't in. The, unfortunately, the ACA, the, they often talked about bending the cost curve. That is not what Americans care about. I'll be very clear. Americans think this nation needs to spend more on health. It's not that we spend too much. That's what you, every economist would say. They think that we need to spend more. They need to spend less. So it's, they're not talking. They're talking about their own personal health care costs. They're not talking about national health care costs. But yet the, the political and policy the discussion in Washington always goes to national, it's federal health spending. And so whenever they hear they're going to cut federal health spending, well, that's bad in the public's mind. So, right. Next question. We have one right here. Might I hand the mic over? Hi, I'm Cliff Devaney, and I'm a president and CEO of Assuma Health System in Akron, Ohio. Mm. Recently left Colorado. Um, and I think the thing that I've noticed in the last six months is the hopelessness in Ohio. So uh, Jefferson County, Steubenville, Ohio, used to be a big steel company. And, and the thing that I, that I see is that in our Northeast Ohio, the top 10 employers are health systems. Mm. And so what we're going to see is we've gone from a manufacturing community and economy to a health system economy. You all have any sense of what the impact's going to be as a result of the, uh, the changes? the loss of jobs, uh, the effect on that. I join. I mean, there's, there's been this, you know, there's this. So I, I actually right? have a question for my co-panelists who are a little bit more expert in unpacking. Uh, the, and actually, the, he's in from an integrated health care system that actually is doing social determinants. But yes. you, you two can talk later. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm picking up on something uh, that Kathleen Sebelius said yesterday which is that you know, the vast majority of people get their health care through their employers um, who are either, you know, who may be self-insured or smaller employers who are providing it. 
that the sliver of people who are experiencing the biggest price increases are the folks who are out, who are getting into health care through the individual market. And that's where- On the upper end of that. On the yeah, upper end right. of the that. The subsidies are smaller and the right. pockets are right. bigger. Um, okay, so where the heck was I going with this? Um, the, the I told you I was going to do a Rick Perry in the middle of this. Um, so um, it's the mountain air. It's the mountain, it's the mountain, air. mountain air. Yes, oxygen. Um, so it's a great excuse to that. Yeah, but I, I don't have to I get your what titles I'm right. Trying to figure out is um, the degree to which the conversation that we're having about wanting to pay less for your health care but spend more nationally on health care. Um, and the ACA and or whatever the, the, the next iteration of it is, is going to result in any job loss in the healthcare sector because the vast majority of people are gonna stay in the healthcare sector pretty much the way they are. And so that's what I'm, well, so I mean, there's I, this, I'm, the, I'm we're talking kind of, about spending less on healthcare nationally. Yes. At the same time that healthcare jobs have been the driver of the economic recovery. Correct. Since but I mean, will every anything, quarter. Will anything in this new iteration of federal healthcare policy impact um, jobs? I think that's the question you're asking, yeah. isn't I, it? And, I, and I'm not, I, I can't figure that out because I think the, the issue, uh, the people, uh, the opinions that we're talking about are largely well, people I who think, are in I the mean, individual I, You market. know, you would want a health economist up here, but I, yeah. you know, I would assume that what you would say is that when you take $8 billion out of a, an industry, you know, it, that, that a large portion true, of that true, is true. paying okay. for something that yeah. is probably going ultimately to jobs. So yeah. I think it would be hard to say that it wouldn't. I don't, I'm yeah. certainly okay. not an expert enough to say where those, where would have those implications. Yeah. That narrative that you're finding in the focus groups, and, 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 and I hear anecdotally, and I think you've probably not come polling, across it right. too, is, 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 you know, that sense that somebody else is getting something yeah. and I'm not. And it, in some way, and it, I think it ties into the debate about Medicaid work requirements, mm -hmm. when actually oh, yeah. the workforce requir the, the workforce participation on, in Medicaid for able-bodied people is not that different. Mm -hmm. It's like two or three points different than the rest of the population. Um, it, it sort of does sound like, you know, it used to be a welfare debate, yeah. you know, the welfare queen debate. And, and in some ways we're having the, the the undeserving, they're getting free health care, and I'm yeah. paying through the nose, and, I, and, and we, that and sense I of say, a, and that is people of feeling the, aggrieved. Right, and that's something that is really different in our polling, is that, you know, everybody across the board says that Medicaid is an important program to their communities and to their families. Even half of Trump voters tell us that Medicaid is an important program to their families. What is different across the party partisan divide is when we say, ask a question like, is Medicaid more um, like uh, more like welfare, like a food stamp program that helps people pay for food, or is Medicaid more like Medicare, a uh, health insurance program that helps people pay for health care? Overall, people say it's more like a health insurance program. It's like you know Medicare. But for Trump voters and for Republicans, they are more likely to think that it's something more like welfare. And so then there's this sense of it's it's not fair to me. I'm a working class American who is desperately trying to get by. I have job-based insurance, but my job-based insurance, my deductibles and my co-pays are going up. So even if my employer is picking up a lot of my premium costs, I'm still paying a lot more out of the doctor, so much so that I'm not going to go to the doctor unless I'm on my deathbed. You know, that's what they tell us. And so I do think that that's sort of a big underpinning of where the re redistribution um, is going and, and who's going to get help under the Senate bill um, as opposed to under the ACA. Right. Can I ask a quick question because it kind of ties into that and then we got a few other folks here who want to ask questions too. So I think this is fantastic and really fascinating and interesting but I think a lot of what we've been talking about gets back to something and I don't remember who exactly mentioned this but the ACA and the AHCA really just talk about health insurance coverage. And what we really know is it's much broader than just health insurance coverage, right? And I think some of the things that you were just mentioning is when you start to get to some of the, what may be considered social determinants of health, people start to overlap mm -hmm. across partisan divides or part across other kind of typical cutting points, right? When you're in a party, how can I get my people plus one more over to vote for my candidate? So my question is, I guess, 
based on either data or experiences that you've had, not talking about health insurance, but some of these more social determinants of health, are there other places that have health impacts that seem to overlap as well on this partisan divide? Does that make sense? Yeah, um, you know, the Robert Wood Johnson with uh, NORC um, has just done a really big survey project on trying to um, tease out sort of how people think about the culture of health and they really do a deep dive on a lot of different of these values in these different components. And I would just urge you to look at that material. It's really quite extensively done. They're, they're you know, it's part of a big project that they're doing. Um, I think more generally, you know, what I can say is that, you know, the American public at the end of the day, you know, are really nice people. They want people to be healthy. They want, you know, good roads. They want good education. They want um, good parks. They want food. Like they, all those things, if you just ask about it, they understand that they're important and they want that for themselves and for everybody. But, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to tough redistribution um, issues, that's where you get real divides, and there's a real different sort of ideological perspective about how should you redistribute, it, redistribute wealth in this country. If you were going to caption your picture, James, mm -hmm. in light of the conversation, if you were to put like a three or four word pick, caption under that, if you were not a data journalist but a caption writer, what would it be? I can tell you what I wrote originally, okay. but um, I, I'm not sure I can repeat it, but I, th I think... <laughs> Uh, I, I think the original Instagram caption was something along the lines of um, Trump supporters are too unwell in order to stand long enough to hear the ritual, I think, something along the lines. I mean, I don't think if any so, of us were writing, we would but, use the word happy or hopeful. Yeah. Um, but it did, it did look pretty miserable, yeah. yeah. And I think if we were looking at, you know, Sue talked about the other developed countries and how they, you know, spend less but have better outcomes, I think if we had to match this photo with you know, where you were asked, is this Denmark, Sweden, France, or Western Pennsylvania? You, you would know. You know so, uh, <laughs> right. Now, we have a couple of questions yes. here, right here. Oh. We, who's got the mic? Someone have I have a okay. mic right here. Sorry. One of the um, questions that I have that I feel like has been missing from this conversation is race. Mm. And I think, you know, when we think about um, who didn't vote in this last election, um, it was a lot of them were African American women. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, there's, is, is there as much energy going into understanding where African-American women and African-Americans, generally speaking, stand right now around health issues, around some of the issues that you've been talking about, as there is in trying to understand what's happening in rural Ohio? Um, I think it's a critical issue. I think the in, all of what the things that we're talking about and that we're struggling with right now, in my opinion, have a racial undertone. And that has not been discussed here. So I'm just curious. Did you, what did you see when you looked at, I mean, the Trump voters were the white voters, the state. I mean, there were districts in, yeah. in, in outside of, in, in the Detroit area where just a few precincts, the turnout might have made a difference for the state. Yeah, she raises a good point. Did, um, maybe that's your next project. <laughs> exactly. I mean, turn, turnout was the big, big unknown going into the election. And coming out of the election, you know, the, the CPS data suggests, obviously, yeah, turnout diminished among African Americans generally. That's what we, we suffer from many of the same. Right. Yes. Yeah, diabetes Absolutely. and you know, these are really high disparities. Like you would know the the number, the statistic, but it, the 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 diabetes rate among African Americans is very very high. Yeah. yeah, and I would just say that, you know, it, and it's a really good point, and it's a point I meant to make, is that these communities, rural communities, are not homogeneous. They have um, mixed race populations. There's African Americans, there are Latinos in these communities. There's also Democrats and independents and Republicans. And so some of the same partisan divides that we see everywhere else, we also hear about in these communities. I think. Um, I think that the, the question of race is an unbelievably important one. I think one of the things we've seen in all the healthcare polling is that because African Americans are so disproportionately likely to identify as Democrats, they have been among the, 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 the staunchest supporters 
of, ACE, of ACA and of the Obamacare and of, of the things. Their, their favorability rates are very, very high. And those are still there. And I think maybe that's one of the reasons why they're dropping out of the discussion right now in the, in the political discussion, because you know, the Democrats almost, at some level, don't really have a voice right now in the conversation about what's happening. And so I think that's one of the reasons it's not getting enough attention, but you're exactly right. I know that and in I, Washington today, right now, there I mean, just about right now, there is, there's the, what they call the tri-caucus, I think. Mm -hmm. It's the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and the Asian, uh, Asian Pacific Caucus, I think, are, are doing an event really looking at what these cuts mean mm -hmm. uh, in terms of healthcare access. Medicaid is right. big, yeah. But I, I think you, you make a really important point, um, and, uh, I'll, I'll illustrate where I think our narrative sometimes goes wrong in the direction that you're talking about. So there are some compelling data that were published recently that showed that you know white middle-aged uh, men in particular are for the first time in decades seeing a decline in life expectancy. And um, you know every all all other racial groups are seeing increases in life expectancy. So the narrative for African Americans is that you know, the gap in life expectancy is closing and that there, we're seeing um, improvements. But then you know, I'm, I'm reading all of this and I go back to the tables and the life expectancy for African Americans is still unacceptably lower than you know, where it's coming down in, in, in this, you know, in the white population. So I don't have a solution for that, I'm, but I, I just want to validate that, you know, that conversation needs to be happening more than it's happening. Um, and, you know, this particular conversation went around an analysis that looked at, um, you know, public health indicators of well-being. And um, those, you know, th that, that's really what we were talking about. Um, over and above and controlling for race and education. So it, 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 it is there and it is um, and I would, troubling. I mean, this is what I, I, ha I remind students all the time that, you know, election outcomes matter. And, you know, this election outcome mattered in a lot of ways. And one of the main ways is it really changed the nation's conversations. And it changed, you know, what we're talking about. And I was actually, you know, there was a sense, I think, beforehand, it, probably not getting enough, enough, but at least there was a conversation about inequalities and about race and about racial inequalities in America that was really happening on the national level. And that has really um, gone away, I think, and it's a really unfortunate that it's gone away because of the, um, the change in the election. Right, we had the a criminal justice discussion. Yeah. We were talking about how do we talk about opioids versus yeah. how do we talk about cocaine. That, that conversation we're not hearing right now, maybe yeah. that's a topic for next year. I think we need to, do we have time for one more? No, zero minutes remaining. We don't. We're all going to be here. I want to close with one tiny anecdote. It's a Washington Post story. Um, a reporter went to a Trump rally in Nashville, talked to a woman there whose son, a middle-aged woman who could have fit in this picture, whose son had lost his job. And she said, I'm not worried at all because he has Trump care now. And the reporter said, it's great. And he gets this free. And he gets that free. And he's not paying. And the reporter said, that's not Trump care. That's Obamacare. And the woman said, oh, no. President Trump fixed it. So <laughs> thank you for attending. Yeah.